Hello, I'm Derek Wheatley and welcome to episode 194 of the Weekly Weekly Podcast. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, a big thank you for, uh, sorry, to Nick Groom for coming on last week. Uh, psychotherapist, um, a man who has had his own traumas and it, from when he was young and he talks through that and talks into how he became a psychotherapist. Um, we talked a little bit about his kind of photography and uh, we got into films that <laughs> usually goes that way. Uh, but he was he was a brilliant guest. And yeah, go back and uh, uh, listen to him if you haven't done so already. You can support us on Buy Me A Coffee. Uh, the link will be in the description. This week's guest is uh, the director and screenwriter behind the film Hole in the Head. And his name is Dean Kavanagh. How are you doing, Dean? Hello. How are you, Derek? How's it going? I'm very well. You're the first person who has saluted me, which is very nice. <laughs> I won't be the last one. Well, no, to be honest, I'll take it. I'll take the first one. We'll see what happens. Listen, thank you very much for doing this um, on this Sunday afternoon. Uh, I, I'm very, very happy to to be in your company for this. We always start at the beginning, Dean, where we should begin. Um, can you give us a, a short history of your upbringing, please? Uh, sure. Um, I uh, grew up in a small village in the north of Wicklow called Kilcool, which is where they shot um, Glen Rowe. Huh. And yeah, <laughs> very important fact there. Yes. Right? Uh, so I grew up in, with uh, my mother and my father, and I have uh, three younger siblings, one younger brother, two younger sisters, and an older sister from my father's uh, relationship prior to my mother. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was, I was, I grew up with uh, the younger siblings there and uh Eventually, uh, we moved to Greystones. Uh, Greystones uh, voted the world's most livable community in 2004 by the Chinese or something. Your, facts, uh, your facts already are <laughs> ex ex exceptional. Oh, this is the way it is, you know. <laughs> um, but it was, though. It was so bizarre that it was. Um, uh, but back then, I suppose Greystones was kind of different. I mean, I mean, like when you say Greystones now, people probably think, oh, very affluent kind of upbringing. And it's like, absolutely not. My granny died. We vampirically took the home. That's kind of what happened. And uh, when I grew up in Greystones, it was like, OK, you have the harbor, you've got the fishermen, you've got the, the ocean, you've got the beach, you've got the, kind of the mountains, you've got the woods. It was kind of this everything. Mm -hmm. So it was a great place to kind of grow up. Um, and also, you know, there were a lot of fields there at the time, less so now. Now it's kind of like where there's green, the government kind of see green, if you know what I mean. And yeah. it's kind of just overdeveloped. But yeah, you did smell shit on the fields. You'd know what you'd know what time of day it was, you know, which day of the week it was based on that alone. Um, and I went to uh, a school in Greystones and then uh, I went to a secondary school in Bray mm -hmm. for six years. And uh, yeah, during that time, I suppose my parents divorced um and yeah and yeah it was interesting it was an interesting kind of it was a good childhood I think um it was lots of interesting funny stories like uh the school I went to in, in, in Greystones right it was like it's a former Christian brothers school actually my father used to go there um uh, he has the bruises to prove it now uh so when 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 I was going there you still had to call the male teachers master which was so bizarre. And then the, the female teachers, Smith, you know, and there were way more male teachers than female teachers. I didn't think, I thought that was real weird because I went to another primary school, as I said before that, where it was just sir and miss. When I went to secondary school, it was real weird because I was still accidentally saying master. And I was like Renfield in the class, you know, like kind of, <laughs> it was this immediate, like kind of bullying territory. But it was, that was kind of unusual. Um, and any other bizarre, I mean, <clears throat> Greystones has the Father Ted cinema. You know, that that was there. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Greystones is kind of more interesting than I guess some people might have assumed be before, you know, because like, I mean, the best place to live in the world. <laughs> in <laughs> to these lads, like we came over there, he'd never been probably anywhere else. And just yeah. said, ah, this is great. We won't go anywhere else, you know. But I mean, so, when you, maybe... Dean, when you describe it, though, it, it does sound pretty good with, the, you know, the, the woods the sea yeah. you know it, it had a bit of everything that you would like so it kind of and feels and that and it makes kind of sense yeah, um, yeah. maybe I mean, when you're making films and stuff like with that um you know you've got every kind of background you kind of want you know so yeah, that, that was great right um so coming off that the other question we always ask dean is um when did you first become aware of mental health um 
Well, I suppose I definitely was aware from quite young of the word mental and of the word health, mm. but very rarely was it in the same in in in, in the same phrase. Uh, like I suppose uh, definitely uh, in my immediate family, people with mental health issues, um, people in my extended family. Uh, my friends, families. This is even just growing up to like around nine or 10. I, I kind of noticed this, but you know, mental, like just taking that first part, um, that was like a, in the nineties, a very bad or a very good thing. Yeah. If, if the word mental was used, you know? So I think when it came to stuff like the gray area of like, you know, depression or anxiety or anything like this, that wasn't really, you really had to be full blown mental. Mm. And everything else didn't exist. Yeah. So um, it wasn't really something you would really see or hear about. You know, it was kind of you just that guy is mad or something. And yeah. usually by the time he's defined as such, he probably is mm. at that point. Um. So and health was just, you know, doing 10 laps of the, of the pitch. But I suppose. Um, but when I look back on it, there were a lot of things definitely mm. within, as I said, within my family and within friends, families. And I don't think it really dawned on me uh, until I really went to secondary school. That's when I could, I kind of saw, I saw um, it kind of affect people my age, I suppose, more. Yeah. Up until that point, uh, it was definitely watching grownups or adults dealing with these things that I didn't know what was, you know, it's just their personality or it's just their, but in hindsight, there were a lot of, you know, flags blowing in the tornadoes. Um, but in secondary school, it was interesting. Yeah, it was like um, substance abuse, um, like all kinds of things. I mean, just to say, I mean, to paint the person before the landscape, like uh, I didn't really have a, a lot of friends when I moved to Greystones because, you know, like all my friends are in the other school and then you're everyone's already made their friends. And But that wasn't really a problem for me. I was very much like couldn't wait to get home to finish writing this thing or to shoot this little bit of the film or to beat my sister's home so I could take the dollhouse. I was shooting a, a, a little animation in back to their room before, you know, they get in trouble and I wouldn't be allowed to use it again. So <clears throat> I was very much uh, kind of living in this kind of world that I'd built. And then when I got to secondary school, it was like, you know, kids were throwing chairs at teachers, a lot of kind of antisocial behavior and I suppose at the time I didn't immediately link this to like mental health at home or just the, the family life. But uh, I mean, at this point, my parents had, had, had split up. And so, you know, um, I was in this school pretty much because <laughs> I mean, like we didn't have a lot of money and my mother was pretty much holding the house together. I, as I said, three younger siblings and this school had like an amazing book rental scheme. It had a bunch of these other state supported, uh, I guess, kind of grants and supports. Um, but, you know, like kids would be punching in the lockers, taking your books, flushing them in the toilet, leaving them on the pitch, um, throwing milk on you or whatever. So yeah, I'd be going around, had, had all my books in my bag because you couldn't leave them in the yeah. in the thing. And it was just these little incidents where you meet people, <clears throat> you, um, you kind of go, well, this guy's stealing the books because, well, he if he goes home and tells his parents he doesn't have books, they'll, they'll, they'll beat him or something. Yeah. Um, or this kid is like, you know, drinking perfume or something. <laughs> There's a kid who drank perfume and fell over and hit his head in the basketball court. He's doing that because, you know, something happened and mm. he just couldn't deal with the day. And these are kind of things at the time you kind of, you were shocked by it. But I remember over time, even just before the junior started thinking like, okay, there's a reason why this is happening. And, and at this point, I think there was a really strong social education in the school. Like I said, it was there were, it was a mixed school. So um, there was lots of there was sex education and there was, uh, I guess, talking about mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was oddly enough, <laughs> funny enough, that was done in uh, like a religion class, which is which is hilarious. But um, we had a really interesting religion teacher and she was she was really she was really hardcore. She was very much about. Uh, I say more, probably in the end, probably more spiritual than actually kind of within yeah. some kind of orthodox situation. But um, that was fascinating. And, and I think the kids, even though th they were messing in a lot of other classes, they genuinely paid attention in that class, oddly oh. enough. So I think they were getting a lot of whatever was being said was of interest. I so, think, uh, Dean, like what, what you're saying about that. Um, I've obviously asked this question to everybody that's come on, you know, about mental health. And I, I think a, a lot of people have said that they may have been uh, may have had anxiety when they were teens and didn't know what it was. And that would suggest, um, 
if you don't know what something is and you're feeling a particular something, you'll try anything to get away from it and you'll try mm-hmm. alcohol, you'll try drugs. You might even try violence. You might try stealing, you know, all those kind of things. And I, it, it's, it's kind of, there's a few different ways that I've been taking the answers to the question and try to think about like what, what they mean. But one in particular seems to be that, that kind of that teen thing about not knowing exactly what mental health is. So they're not able to yeah. point out how they're feeling. And, mm-hmm. and then, it leads into something else. And I think that's, you know, it's up to then to the schools now to be able to kind of get in there earlier and start to talk about it. And hopefully that is happening. I, I, I don't know. Um, but let's, let's hope so. I wanted to go on because I, because, because they, your whole school is like, sounds like a, a made up uh, movie uh, anyway. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but um, I, give me I, funding you... to make a kind of Derry Girls North Wicklow. Yeah. There you go. We'll do I, it. Like, I um I recently watched a terrible film uh, called The Fablemans. People will know what it is. It's Steven oh, Spielberg. Film, yeah. So people loved it, and I just didn't get it. But what I did find interesting about it was the fact that you know, from such a young age, someone can be interested in um not just you know the motion picture, but actually making their own films. And you already kind of touched upon that. What age were you when you started to kind of look at films as something that you could actually make yourself? Probably around ten. I'd say okay. 10. Um, I just remember that's when we were, we had access to a video camera. Um, I was shooting, I was at a wedding, my auntie's wedding, and uh, I was just handed the video camera so that the older people could socialize. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was given strict instructions of what not to film and what conversations, you know, to, to, to avoid. And um, yeah, so I took this very seriously and I brought it home and I you know, connected it to two VCRs. I remember figuring it all out. It was a lot of it was in camera, but um it was my, my my father was also helping with some music. He was selecting the music they wanted over it. So we were using two VCRs to dub it together. And that was great. It was just a lot of little magic tricks and making people appear and disappear. And and at that point, I watched a lot. I was obsessed with movies by the time I was, you know, nine or ten. I was absolutely obsessed. Um, and so that was the kind of start. And I thought, okay. Um, so I began to fixate because of that. I guess it's that it's that line of the Melies line of uh you know, within a single splice, you can create impossible or you can make the impossible possible. So it was really just focusing on that. And I was already interested in drawing and, and writing. And so stop motion animation was was the kind of thing I began to do because you could, because my father was a photographer and, and um, he had taken uh, one of the corrugated sheets off the shed. So he had this kind of, again, Meliesian kind of uh, natural light space and he had his own lights and i would just go down there and i'd do use his lights or use the natural light um and it really kind of developed kind of from that so it was always it's kind of funny yeah it, it, started, it began as a kind of solitary thing mm. and uh and then when it was when i was in my teen, when i had more when i had kind of more friends when i was in my teens early teens i suppose it became a group kind of activity and everyone i knew was kind of interested in films also um and and then eventually when I really began to focus on it and ended up going into a for, uh, toward a more experimental route, it became a solitary thing again. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of, it's interesting, this kind of, the way it kind of moves around this kind of the way that I suppose the digital camera enables a person to kind of act on their own and to be as a, you know, as Kiristami said, to be like a painter and to, to kind of work alone. And that's kind of interesting, but yeah, growing up, there's a lot of stop motion animation and, um, yeah, a lot of stuff like that, really. And I would send, would... I would make these huge things. I'd send them off to my sister. You know, she was living in London. So she moved back to Dublin and she'd just arrive home and she'd have like a two hour stop motion feature with, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff going on in it. And she would, I would send her, I remember the talk boy things from like home. Yeah, alone. I had one. <laughs> I had yeah. one of those. Yeah, they were great, weren't they? <laughs> yeah, they were so yeah. good. <laughs> but who, who were you? Um, like when, like at that age, when you did start, who were you, who were you watching? Who was influencing you? Um, I think I remember the first film I ever saw was uh, Excalibur by John Borman. Okay. And then I saw uh, Mask of the Red Death, uh, the Vincent Price, Roger Corman film. And then Nosferatu and a bunch of other things. <clears throat> a big one was Terminator. Terminator 2 I was never really allowed to watch the first one. But uh, my parents were extraordinarily strict when it came to censorship. Oh. Uh, ridiculously so. Um, but Terminator 2, I remember my father was watching it one day and 
I was just sat in the room and I got to watch Terminator. If I made a noise, he'd realize I was there and then, you know, I'd be kicked out. Yeah. But um, he realized I was there and he was like, oh, this isn't too bad. It's just, he was just kind of blown away by it because no one mm. had ever seen anything quite like it. I remember that shot where like the T-1000 kills like John Connor's mother, stepmother. Oh, God, yeah. And yeah, sticks him to the wall with the... Yeah. I remember that and I remember that just happened and my father looked over at me you know he's like did he didn't Dean didn't see that did he and I'm just there like wide-eyed at the screen and I swear to god man my voice metamorphosed into that of like a 65 year old cigar chomping you know whiskey drinking lad at the bookies and I looked at him and I just said like play it again <laughs> and uh yeah he, he just turned it off um but... <laughs> well it, it, I I think of I I told this story before on here I'm sure of it but like I watched uh, Deliverance with my dad oh wow and there was a scene that I didn't get to see. All right. So he turned it over to the news or something, whatever. And um, mm. when mm. I, a few years later, put on the DVD, I wish he was still around. I wish he was there to turn it off and put on the news. It's <laughs> only, you know, it's you're you're um, you're saved these things for a good reason. And like, I know I know what mm. you mean about Terminator 2. Like, I remember watching it for the first time um, with my two brothers. And it was just like insanity really like mm -hmm. it, we'd never see obviously we'd never seen anything like it before you know um and probably have never seen anything like it since because i don't really keep up with the action kind of stuff but i do remember mm -hmm. that film standing out for those moments of like the the special effects were just insane yeah yeah there was no you couldn't really think about how it was made like yeah. because using computer generated imagery i mean my father would know you know darkroom kind of chemistry and tricks like that and he'd be but this kind of stuff was kind of far beyond and we didn't have photoshop at that point yet even or anything so well our family didn't but that was kind of bizarre it's funny what you say though about the deliverance thing my this is this is very important maybe like that i mean i was obsessed with censorship mm -hmm. because my parents whenever something was on tv like you know die hard with a vengeance is on and i want them to record it and they're like okay but they would sit through it and they would stop the tape when something was terrible was happening and they'd press record again. If it wasn't too bad, I'd get to keep going. So by the time I saw like Predator or any of these films, they were like 25 minutes long because <laughs> they just jump cut everything out of them. Yeah. Um <clears throat> to a to a certain point where um I would get, if you remember the um the BBFC ratings from the British Board of Film Classification, there were kind of these big red 18s on the yeah. on, a, on a, a video case. It was kind of fascinating and terrifying but i would i would um obviously we just released them as they were but after a while the irish film classification office they would stick the blue kind of for the octagonal or something hexagonal kind of stickers over them and you could remove them with an iron with steam from an iron okay. and i'd put them on the little slips so you get them with a blank tape these little sticker slips with the numbers and the yeah labels. i put yeah. them on there and i cut the ones out when i started printing them on the artwork i would cut them out <laughs> with a craft knife and i swear to christ i would go to the video shop we had a chart busters we had an extra vision at one point we had two extra visions um and I would slip them under the cover, the spine and the front and the back, and I would just close it and the plastic would keep them intact. And I would just say, OK, I want to rent this with like aliens Genius. and also Teenage Mutants, Tinder Turtles. I don't know what is Revenge of the Ooze or something. Yeah. And they go, OK, we go up and before I hand it to the clerk, pop them out. He gives back the thing. It goes into a black, you know, the library case. Yeah. When they got rid of those, it went into a sheath. You just thumb the 18 cert. That was it. And Jeez. I never got caught. Did that for years. Um, and I, I say this because I was recently moving and um my stuff from my mother's house, and I found all these this little baggie with all these little chopped up certs. Paraphernalia. So, yeah, bizarre. <laughs> um, <laughs> when, funny, yeah. when you moved like to the point of maybe having more confidence in your filmmaking, or maybe you always had confidence, but when you decided that I could maybe get something out of this you know actually get it produced um how did you go about that um <clears throat> well i suppose there was realizing that no one was going to help that mm -hmm. it was just going to be me doing it and um i had sort of sidestepped that standard trajectory of you know short to short to feature and if your feature doesn't make it then you have one more shot and then if not well then you know think of something else um, because I, I was afraid of that happening. And also I really loved making shorts and I made a lot. I made like, you know, like in one year I made like 25 shorts. I, at one point I made like three shorts a week. Um, and it was, I suppose I might, I might be a little bit different to other filmmakers insofar as, um, I mean, I didn't have actors at a certain point. I didn't have crew or anything like that. There was no sound in some of the films because I couldn't afford or didn't have sound gear. So these films are really based around, I guess, my life and what was happening around me. And 
trying to sell that or put that into a place was difficult because you had to focus on the form and if the form could be eye-catching or it could be interesting in the way it's cut and the way it deals with these images then maybe there was a chance that people would be interested in watching it and slowly i suppose subconsciously perhaps this kind of began to take shape and um i made a feature and i didn't send it anyway it screened once i think um it screened in in Spectacle Theatre in New York, thanks to Donald Foreman. He screened it, and that's the only time it ever screened. And I made a, a you know I made a bunch of films that never screened anywhere. I gave up submitting to festivals for a number of years, um, and I suppose at that point I had nothing to lose. And I think that might be something that mm. maybe some people get it gets ahead of them. Like I, I had a friend, and I remember him saying to me like uh, I don't know I'm I finished shooting this feature, but now I'm not going to release it or share it with anyone because i don't really like it and right. you have that one shot you know but um i just think if you if you really look at what it is you're trying to do and, and the kind of audience you're looking at uh, sharing the film with there's a lot of ways you as an individual this is one person or maybe you've two people or three people especially now at social media you can really get this off the ground with very little money um of course it helps to have money um uh and I have been doing this for 15 years without any money, really, though I've had some great support from the Arts Council, of course. But, you know, when it comes to telling you how to exhibit your films, no one really there's no module in film school. I went to film school. There's no module in film school that tells you how to do that. And that would have been far more interesting than some of the other modules I had to take. But um, it's it's hard. to. There's no kind of hard and fast rule. I don't I don't think um, don't give up would be the main thing become sort of a masochist in sort of a way that expect the failure and maybe you'll be surprised um but i remember the yeah the first it was for me it was i suppose realizing that this stuff was in expert that this this kind of films i was making were perhaps more digestible in a situation that was geared towards experimental arts so uh that i always got a better response from the kind of films I was making when it was in that situation. If my film was playing by itself, <laughs> if my, if it was a feature, it would do pretty well. And if it was a short put in a program of shorts, what might have, what often happened was people would say, oh, that's a little bit too narrative. That What was that narrative one there? Or vice versa, you know, like a traditional narrative program. What's that experimental film doing there? So, I mean, I probably, I tried to go further into experimentation to find an audience that way. Um, I tried to go, I, I reached that limit and I was no longer interested. And then I just, the film Hole in the Head that I made was just like, um, I thought, okay, well, I'll just try and do something that is a mixture of both. Mm. Um, and I suppose, I mean, finding an audience was just down to the fact that there was enough narrative or enough drama or enough human elements for people to sit through it. <laughs> and to allow themselves to have the other elements be introduced to them um, over the course of the 90 minutes or so. Um, I guess I was thinking more in terms of audience before. Um, I mean, I was always thinking in terms of audience, but bef this time I wasn't just thinking about a room of stroboscopic flashing films. Yeah. I was thinking of like, okay, um, I'd like to share something in a wider uh audience and a kind of a broader sphere if uh, that answers your question it yeah. probably doesn't whatsoever no it, do, it, it no it does it does and, and like because i want to get onto a hole in the head for people that don't know now I, I got to see it um uh, last week i think and i watched it one morning very early one morning i always get up early and i love to, i love to watch a film early in the morning because i feel like things are opened up I'm, I'm able to take it in a bit more so i like you know the whole thing about narrative and experimental is 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 great about the film because it kind of it leads you to places and then it kind of stops you there and then you're like eh, and then you go again I thought the film was absolutely brilliant for many reasons and I do have questions uh, about uh, the film and about the, the 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 story and where the seed for something like that comes from because I think a lot of people will think well I, maybe I could write a narrative film maybe I could write a story and we could you know make a film from it and other people might think oh, I'd be really good at the experimental side of things but you're mixing the two things together and I, I can imagine that's quite difficult but I haven't talked to you now for the last whatever 20 minutes you've mentioned a couple of things that have are in the film so obviously you do mix some of your life in there like you said yeah yeah for sure I mean that all kind of adage of you write what you know but mm -hmm. um i guess 
it was I, I didn't like I was saying I, I didn't want to I was trying to find a way to I was thinking if I was going to do another film then I wanted to do one that I could share with a lot of people and I wanted it to be sort of about the experiences that I had making these other types of films mm. um and I thought that would be kind of funny and it would write itself and it actually came it was a it was a short story I'd written a few years before um I was writing a couple of them to potentially adapt as a full narrative feature and like what you were saying about oh, I would like to write a narrative or like to write something more experimental I suppose I mean I really tried to write this as a straight narrative because the story was a straight mm. narrative but it was far more interesting to kind of lean into what I was doing before and I think that gave it a little bit of a different kind of personality to other films that were out at the time but um it really just developed from that from really bizarre experiences I'd had not just in the experimental film community but like you know I'd kind of been working in the film industry at large like at, at various different jobs for probably around the same amount of time and so a lot of mad people there as well um so it was drawing from all these different kind of pools but I'm glad to say I'm, I'm glad to hear that you, you you liked it and that you watch films early in the morning I used to love doing that mm. I'd love to do that more it That's is great. it's true it's like planting a seed and throughout the day you kind of think about it and yeah, I really like I really had to think about it like it, it was kind of a lead lead me down different paths. And, um, you know, I think that's, you know, like you mentioned, it's a great thing about watching early in the morning because you have that time. Like even if you're just doing something mundane during the day, you do have time to kind of think about it or you go for a run. You're thinking about the film. But like someone did ask me the, the following day after I told them about the film, I said I'd watch the film and you were coming on. They said, what's it about? Now, I don't want you to tell me what's it about, but I did not have a good answer. So, like, if you had to give, like, a brief description, you know, like, a, like almost like a plot, whatever you call it, a plot headline, could you give us one of them? Sure. Um, well, the film is about a, 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 a young man whose parents disappeared when he was a, a, at the age of, of, of seven or so, and they disappeared in such a traumatic manner that he has no recollection of any of his upbringing. He has no recollection of what happened and he no longer has the power of verbal communication. And so he is now, as I said, like kind of maybe in his like mid to late thirties and he is an amateur filmmaker and working in a, a cinema. So he decides to uh, inherit, he inherits the family home uh, is his parents declared deceased and he moves back there hiring two actors, one to play his mother, one to play his father. And he attempts to unravel what may have happened uh, when he was a child using these this kind of fictional tapestry. Yeah. And at the same time, it adds the other question of, is this guy really this person? Potentially, is this someone who has heard about this and is like yeah. decided to walk into the situation? So it never quite answers that. But in my opinion, I prefer that. Yeah. Kind of, and I love those films, you know, those films where people the kind of not quite home invasion but okay like there's funny games of course but like films like theorem by pasolini mm -hmm. where someone just shows up or vis Q, the adaptation of theorem when the guy just kind of introduces himself to his family kind of ruins their life or the shout uh that, that film um i, love I just this bought kind that of the, idea i just bought that the other day and i haven't watched it yet. i literally bought it the oh, other day the shout it's good it's incredible film yeah, yeah you got you'll love that absolutely yeah. um yeah, that's a that, that's a really interesting to what uh, maybe that's an interesting double bill. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, the shout's incredible. Um, it's so terrifying in a really unusual way. Yeah. Um, and it lives up to the shout. You know, when yeah. he shouts, it it's kind of hard to describe. Yeah, good. But, uh, but but are you a fan of Monty Python? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 The and, earlier and the better. Like, I, I hope you don't uh, mind me because I, I always worry about when people come on, artists come on and I, I try or maybe not compare them, but mention that there's, you know, I saw some line between the two. But there was a reel at the beginning when he's talking about his parents and his grandparents. And it was it was very Monty Python-esque and funny, like prop and there is moments in that film that you know. <laughs> There's the one where the main character has the, his his replica or his doll or, you know, sure, his, yeah. and he's walking like in the the field and he's he's after filming, you know, the thing around the stream and he's coming mm. through the, the, the rocks. And I'm thinking to myself, when's Dean going to cut this? Like, wh which, <laughs> at what point is this yeah. going to cut? But he keeps coming. Hey, everyone and... watching that was thinking the same thing, probably. <laughs> Even I was at a certain <laughs> point, yeah. But that's what makes it funny because the whole... 
idea. I thought of me. Imagine you were in that field and you saw this mm. lad play the clambering over rocks with a with a mannequin of himself. Yeah. That you know, and it just made me think of that kind of Monty Python, those sketches that are just very um seriously told, like that mm. real, like I mentioned, but they're very funny in the content. Mm. Well, like it goes to like even the what's the long take uh, and the meaning of life. He's like, follow me this way, this way, and it just—it's <laughs> kind of funny. It's a total yeah. segue, a literal segue. But um, it's funny. It, it gets funnier somehow. It had developed its own kind of mania. Yeah. This is, and, and in that particular shot that just goes on for a very long period of time, I just thought I, after you know, if re- every time I showed it to someone when I was cutting it, it just became funnier. They would laugh like two or three times, maybe yeah. not very loudly, but just kind of smile or something. And it had, it had something about it. Like you say, if you're just sitting in the field and <laughs> eventually it just walks something. I don't know. Maybe it, it's a specific type of, of humor. Yeah. But um, yeah, I thought that was quite fun. And the the opening stuff is, yeah, that's it. That was a those kind of kind of personal histories and mm. family stories. They're always uh, laced with so much, yeah. you know, I mean, even just oral histories sometimes are extremely funny in a very peculiar dangerous kind of way yeah uh, at times but yeah that was yeah, i'm glad you found it funny it is it's supposed no, to be funny but it is particular type it is it's funny. funny it's it's the 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 the, the uh, john is it john devereaux james devereaux james uh, devereaux yeah, apologies yeah. uh james but uh he was playing the piano and that devil's chord you know the the oh yeah the tritone yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. tritone and he's speaking to the the sound guy and it's just this like the, the, it's the it's the reaction from the sound guy to him mm-hmm. saying like, "What are you telling me? What this are you, like, <laughs> what are you telling me this story? exactly like it's just you these know. people that are, I don't know, like the what, what I what I really enjoyed about like spending time with those characters, just even on paper, was that um, you you enter the story at a certain point towards the end of their time with mm. John in this house, so like tensions are kind of fried and it. You know, they've become casual in their their just like and how they dress him down sometimes or how they yeah. ignore him. It, it, it's so ca- it's at that point where things are going to fall apart. So this the sound guy is just, you know, I've been in those situations where someone's just, you know, on commercial shoots, especially where they, they're trying to do something. And you're just like, dude, I'm just trying to get wild track or I'm just trying to <laughs> exist here for a moment. Yeah. And, you know, this guy's trying to keep his energy up or something. And, you know, it's just it's quite funny. Um, yeah, I thought I thought yeah. it was brilliant that the reaction and, and I have to say everybody was brilliant in it. Um, is it difficult for for John Curran to play a, a a role that there is no speaking parts in because it becomes a different kind of acting then altogether, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, jo- well, first of all, about John. John's a comic mastermind. I mean, anyone is listening to this who has met John or knows John, he's extremely funny. He's extremely clever. I mean, he's done improv comedy and all this kind of stuff, and. Uh, and a, a talented drummer and talented sax wow. player, in fact. Um, and even at some of the Q and A's when he was there, I mean, it was just it was great to see have the audience see him as you know as John rather yeah. than as John, yeah, yeah. Um, which was quite complicated actually. Having everyone's name be the same, mm. you know, James is James, John is John. It was actually yeah, and then just there was a load of Johns. It was like three other Johns, and they're all <laughs> in the room at the same time, and um, all playing some of them playing Johns. Yeah. Um, it's you made that, it easy, you know, really, on yourself, didn't you? I just, yeah, absolutely, yeah. But it just seems so Python esque now, and you you, you mentioned <laughs> that the whole thing was like, John, no, not you. But um, <clears throat> yeah, John is. We had a long. There was an original treatment where John would speak, and then we. It never made it to screenplay. It wasn't. It was just difficult to find the character. The character was too present um he was supposed to be kind of watching he's kind of a voyeur but mm-hmm. participates um and then there was the idea of sign language but we really wanted john to learn sign language but then at the same time it was wanting to have a voice a kind of sound that would reverberate around the room um and we came to the conclusion that he should have a kind of speak to text device mm-hmm. and john was very very happy with that as he has admitted on several occasions he didn't have to learn the lines um they were all pre-programmed and he would just hit okay. them. but john john was um involved in where the stresses and and kind of parts of pauses and, and the speed at which it would play back certain words and certain lines and so he had great fun with that but um i've worked with john a couple of times before 
like over the years and, and he's produced one or one of my films in the past and we we just knew each other very well mm. so it was just we had a total shorthand when it came to to making this the first time um we heard his voice um through the through the device it's it's again there's a lot of humor in it because it comes so quickly that you're mm-hmm. thinking to yourself, how did he have that answer ready? Yeah, because yeah. obviously you're thinking like, you know, text to speak devices is one thing, but there's a there's a pause, obviously. Mm. But in one and, and in a couple of um, times there probably is. But it, in the first one you hear, it kind of comes out of nowhere and you don't see the device. Yeah, you just kind of hear it kind of clacking and you sort of just staring directly at yeah. like the line. Yeah. I it's, thought that was really funny. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's and it look again, and that's the thing that I really enjoyed about his performance is the deadpan, uh, you know, mm. and I know that that's what the role, you know, has to be because of, of what he's trying to figure out or if he mm. is trying to figure it out and all those things. Mm. But there was just the way he was able to deliver those lines and in inverted commas, but well, he did deliver them. But, you know, in that way, I, I, yeah. I absolutely loved Um. I really liked the the use um, of the home movie as a as a plot device, and this was obviously something that you we've talked about already. Um, were into anyway, so it seems mm-hmm. like a natural fit. Yeah, it was absolutely. It was like you know, I've worked a lot with found footage uh, in the past, and I've used a lot of my own family's found footage or stuff that I've shot of, of you know. Um, so it, it was just it's a weird way of creating this fake archive this kind of false uh personal history for the character and um and the fact that even with the with the added layer that it, it might also be faked yeah again there's that kind of denominator there that could be quite frustrating to some people watching it but i think it, it, if it doesn't frustrate you then it, it, it'll pay off but um yeah I, I really wanted to use these formats in a way that that had a narrative purpose so um you know, I I kind of assign them different characteristics and different behaviors, you know, like one format is the, the film that John is filming. Mm -hmm. And one variant of that format is the incomplete version that we kind of cut away from. And then another format like tape is home movie and then super eight is home movie. And and then the old photographs, a lot of them were doctored, um, Mm -hmm. you know, Photoshop and stuff like that. And then re-photographed and reprinted. And um, so I suppose, having each each kind of moving image format even sound as well as a kind of with a narrative property that no matter if you were to push the visual aspect of the film you would simultaneously be driving the the story and if you were to push the story element it you know it connects with the visual or the sound you're driving the kind of experimental aspect simultaneously as well and it was just creating that way that these formats aren't just there as a choice or or just a texture. A lot of the films I've made, they have a, in some cases, they have a, a dominant textural quality or sense, uh, I guess, in terms of sensory cinema, a kind of quality that wouldn't be linked explicitly to narrative. But in this case, I really want it to be a handshake between narrative and, and form. Mm. And so they do have a purpose. So when you do cut away to, I don't know, like one of the shots of whatever John's doing um, or the, when they're just dancing in the garden or the, the typical kind of home movie stuff I've seen um, that's in the film, it does bring you further along in the plot that you're seeing something that's connected to something that there is information that's useful. Mm-hmm. It's not just a, a flight of fancy. Yeah. Um, and I suppose that was the decision as part of the way the film was kind of built that it would be, it would have a purpose that these images and these choices of format did have a narrative value, I suppose. Um, and it's a that's a really fun playground to be in, um, coming from my background in experimental film, um, uh, that you can just you have a purpose. There is a narrative purpose. So I suppose the stuff I've written in the past is just you know it's just I could never translate it into cinema because obviously you didn't have the means or whatnot. But finally there was a moment where I combined both of these two things where the visual um, techniques that I'd built up over, you know, like 70 films. Um, so, so, so suddenly they have kind of gripped, connected very well with the narrative idea. And so it, the film really just kind of came out of that. But yeah, for sure. Those formats, it was great. And the actors were using them as well. That was another important thing that a lot of the couple of sequences, their actors are filming themselves, filming each other. 
Um, and that was exciting for them to do. They're no longer, you know, staring down the barrel of a gun. They're pointing it back at me or, or at each other. And I think uh, they had a, it was very invigorating for, for them to do that. And um, to place that within different parts of the schedule was a great way. I mean, our, the producer, Anya Mahler, we were looking at the schedule and it really kind of brought them back to life. You know, it's, it's long days. It's, it's, it's a very low budget. That's during COVID and there's no reception. There's no hot water actually at, at, for, for a lot of the time we were there. And just these little things placed throughout the schedule really helped kind of re-energize, I thought, the performers. Um, but yeah, for formats, hugely important. In fact, um, I'm actually an archivist. I'm a, I film and digital media archivist. Oh. And uh, I have a lot of friends uh, in, in that industry as well. And so I really have a kind of forensic fixation on different formats and different eras and different types of tape and different types of of uh of that of that kind of that kind of stuff so which is the film yeah it came out of that but it's you know for for someone like myself to see the it's almost like a look behind the curtain whilst you're watching the film and it's a it's a kind of you know it's a it's a weird it's weird to see there was a couple of things that that really kind of stood out that weren't I guess, well, one was kind of a spoiler, but it's not really a spoiler because we've kind of discussed it already. But when we find out that this isn't his parents, because you're, you're, you're watching him initially like a home movie anyway. And, and at the start, mm-hmm, and the, mm-hmm. you can see his dad and his mom and inverted commas. And, and then it kind of go, you're it's a, it's more than um, it's more than just a shock in a film. It's like, oh, the whole thing isn't. I'm only like 10 minutes, 15 minutes into this and the yeah, whole yeah. thing isn't what I thought it was at all yeah. because I literally, just, I didn't want to go in. When you gave me the film, I, I read on IMDb the the literal sentence. I didn't want to go in and sure. start looking at things because, you know, I wanted to kind of get my own fresh take. But that in itself is a, is is like looking behind the curtain of a film because it's 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 so, it's such a strange turn. And you, you use, again, this kind of, um, you know, the burning celluloid and, and this kind of stuff, which is on screen looks amazing. I know you did the cinematography for it as well, isn't that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm kind of going all the way all over the place with this one, but the, because I wanted to kind of touch on all those kind of different things, like the, the idea of a, a house as a character, you know, like, mm-hmm. you know. I love that, that stuff. I love that yeah. stuff. Yeah. House as a character. Like a, a lot of these, the, the, like the like Polanski films where it's just pretty much yeah. like a single location drama. It's just great, you know, a room with no one in it and suddenly have this crazy, you know, dramatic potential. There's just yeah. nothing but this room and some rain and something. That's, that's for me, that's, I, I could, you know, and I do, I've like loads of ASMR videos saved where I just like watch like rooms and sounds. But I think, yeah, in movies, it's, I love stuff that's set in a specific place. Like even like stuff like Gosford Park, mm. uh, it's just it's going amazing, from room yeah. to room. Yeah, it's just, I love this where... All of this is reinforcing the drama that's kind of around the characters and it's you can look any part of the frame and there's something kind of happening, whether it's static or it's in motion. And, yeah, yeah, like I think that, you know, that whole thing when John almost gets out of his it's like this dreamlike venture out of exile, you know, and I know he has that he has his job and stuff like that, but all of a sudden he leaves the house and it's on roads and you've got closes up of John's face and everything's kind of trippy. And then you're kind of thinking, well, I was fooled earlier with the whole, you know, that's his parents, it's not his parents. Am I, am I being fooled by that? And I, I love that in films anyway, because mm-hmm. it kind of the the idea that you're not quite sure what's going on. Nobody, well, maybe some people like to know exactly what's going on yeah. right from the film, but I don't. Yeah. You know, I like to go like something like Mulholland Drive. I still don't know if I got that film at all, but I love it. Like, you know. Yeah, a, me too, me too. Yeah, yeah. Or like so, in an empire or something. Yeah, yeah. it's it's like, I... You said it earlier on, like you, you like when you don't give the ending there for someone on a silver platter. Like, yeah, I kind of like the audience to be active and to kind of work mm. for it. But then at the same time, it can be frustrating when they work for it and there's no. Here are all the answers for your exam. You know, you'll get your grade now. It's like film for me. It, it shouldn't be like that. Yeah. And I guess the kind of film the hole in the head is, like I said, in the first ten minutes or fifteen minutes or so, this idea of what you think is going to be the film is not the film yeah um i really enjoy that and then as you say towards the end where you think is this just gonna be another one of those things uh like a fake um and then we don't quite resolve it 
there's kind of a hint at the end, which is kind of nice, kind of an emotional kind of hint at the end. But um, it's about the journey. I think if you've mm-hmm. sat through that much of the film already, I don't, and I've watched audiences do it. No one, if you're going to walk out, you're going to walk out after the 10 minutes when they yeah. realize this is not what the rest of the <laughs> film is going to be like. But um, <clears throat> that, no one's going to walk out at that point. You're there for the ride. You are there. You have gone through this trauma, this uh, kind of sensory overload. And you are just it's almost I, I've described it in the past as like the kind of trauma of the character or or the the kind of journey the the dramatic I suppose arc the character kind of has dissolved it kind of has been on is now put upon the audience mm-hmm. and it's now your problem yeah and now you've you've gone through this experience you don't know how to deal with it and and there, there can't be kind of a, a black and white conclusion um and so if you're up for that if you're up for a bit of divilment in that regard then I think it's kind of the film for you. And, you know, um, I've met people who said that they did not think they would like it whatsoever. Mm. And they came out the other side and like, I was really surprised. And it's usually like you were saying, you know, it's like if you give your if you give into it, if you if you watch it at the right time and the, of, of your day or, or whatever, um, you can be rewarded by that journey. It's not always about where you go, you know, that cheesy phrase, but yeah. it's like, you know, how you get there and, and where you don't end up. I suppose yeah. in this case, um, yeah, I think it's different in many ways to other films in that it, regard. Like, you know, I would say watch it on your own too. I have this, uh, and this isn't a dig at my dad, by the way, but but I remember watching uh, <laughs> Memento with my dad, and I had seen Memento before, and I, I really like Memento. And my dad went to the toilet a couple of times. <laughs> it's like you can't go to the toilet in that film. You will <laughs> listen, Pierce. You'll just have to wait until it's over. Because yeah, yeah, hang on there. <laughs> I, yeah, I can't tell you what happened because you're still not grasping that this isn't going the way it's normally a normal film goes. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, she? Yeah. she? Why is he talking to her? Like that's, yeah, But yeah. <laughs> I think if someone left this film or if someone was beside you in the film, which would maybe be even worse saying, what, what, what was that again? And then you get lost because you're, because they're lost and you don't want to get yeah. lost. So, and um, I, I like, I, I did mention already the cinematography. I, there's something, um, well, it's really beautiful, but, you know, within the house as well as outside of the house, because I think it's not true that people can just point a camera and in Ireland and it looks great, because that's not a, a true statement. Look, we do have great landscape. Glen Row, for example, man. Well, <laughs> there, yeah, but they had a yeah, they had a great landscape there in Wicklow. Um, but you know that the idea of um, people think of cine- cinematography as landscapes and and vistas and all this kind of stuff when there's so much more to it, like within the way you use it within the the projector room or the way you use it within the house um how does how do you, for for people that don't know how do you know what a good shot is that's a very good point actually i i never thought of it that way um i suppose it's maybe it's just like a feeling yeah it's like it's like a feeling of what you think the way I've I still make films, I suppose, is that it's an image kind of appears, whether it's in your head or you you shoot a bit of test material or something, and you find a, an image, and somehow the rest of the film, this image becomes very important, and it kind of dissolves into the rest of the film. It disappears. It it doesn't often make its way into the film, but it has such a profound effect. It could be an unrelated shot or a certain way of shooting something, and I think for me, it kind of re it kind of it seems to. To kind of pollute the rest of the idea before it's even shot and i suppose that's a weird way of answering your question i don't really know what a good mm-hmm. shot is i just it relates back to that image the image that's in your head um in some cases to be totally blunt um to be very non uh, philosophical about it if uh, i mean it's whatever you can get i mean yeah. shooting in the projection booth we do you i mean I wanted to keep that focal length. I didn't want to go too wide. Um, and because that's the only part of the stuff I could light. Mm-hmm. And that was that was why that was shot that way. And then the reverse, that's because I, I have to match. And there has to be information that, that, that is exchanged between both shots. And then that was pretty much it. I think the film really had this very stripped back um, idea of camera movement when to move when not to move how to frame like everything is pretty much framed the way you are there mm-hmm. um in fact probably a bit more like uh, my thing like just like character in the center staring just slightly off yeah, yeah. There. <laughs> kind of like this it's not the yeah. usual shot reverse shot but all these small things that you're kind of trying to make it somewhat interesting for yourself like yeah 
I'm not particularly madly keen on doing over the shoulder shots. Um, and when you don't do that, you have to be really careful about the size of the person in the center of the frame. Like if you were to cut from, for example, me to a shot of you in the exact same position as me, if you are anyway, if the camera's closer or further mm -hmm. away, uh, it won't cut, it'll jar and it'll okay. distract. Um, so all these little things were, that's why the whole thing was storyboarded. So it was storyboarded with these limitations in mind. So the lenses were chosen based on uh, that storyboard and based on what I had. And also the, the way th uh, certain rooms are framed is because that's the only way we could really logistically in that amount of time frame them and light them. Um, uh, I, th I think the only song to finish uh, a film like Hole in the Head is, uh, is My Old Man's a Dustman. <laughs> um, can you explain that? Maybe it's one of those ones that you don't <laughs> explain. Um, I just thought it was oh, this. There's a fucking there's a lovely nihilism in it. Yeah, there's something that's just just fucking horrible. And I like Lonnie Donegan. Um, I grew up. My father was a big fan of his his stuff, and um, so when it I didn't know what to use, and then I was just actually just listening to a bunch of stuff, and I came across a mixed CD. And I put a bunch of the tracks on and that was that was the one I was like, well, that's the that's the track. And uh, that was it. So that was how that was. But I love stuff like that, you know, like, um, uh, Killer Joe. Yeah. I mean, I only just I saw it when it came out, but I only just watched it again recently, um, just before Freakin died, actually. And uh, it's that, that piece at the end where he has the um, stroking mm. that song plays yeah. just at the end. It's just it's so joyous it's so absolutely horrifyingly nihilistic just the use of it it's a re you can really see the director's hand like you can see that was a decision and it's also kind of beautiful because i mean it all was almost his final film in a way um yeah. uh, and i suppose that kind of power when you have something so intense and then you just have this Lonnie Donegan song or something. It's I kind of, am like I I think it's great. I just it it came as another shock, you know. It's like, sure. and that is a good point about Killer Joe. And there there is a, like a number of films that, um, maybe go out on something that you're you're not expecting, and it, yeah. it doesn't always. It can be the opposite of it'll be like a comedy film goes out on something quite slow. It can be the, you know the other way around. Something serious yeah. goes, and it doesn't have to. Yeah. You know, they that's the whole shock in it, but. You know, it's 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 good. It's cool, but it, it was just oh, that was that's another uh, twist. Of what I was expecting. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad that landed well. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, it, what do awards mean, Dean? Are they are they important? Um, to me, not so. I mean, you're talking to a guy who didn't send his films to a festival for like you know a great number of years. I genuinely don't. I'm talking really... to an award winner though. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. I, gen yeah well, I genuinely don't really care so much, but I think it's great that the f if it's a way for the film to get seen yeah. and if it's a way for the the work of the people who made it to be, uh, I suppose, um, shared with other people and to be appreciated, then I think it's it's very uh, useful. Yeah. But beyond that, uh, not so you know if it's an award like an award of money which i could use to make something else uh, yeah. then that would be great but um yeah it's it, if it helps push the film along on yeah. its journey because uh it's as you we were talking a little bit earlier before i went on a wild tangent um that it is so difficult to there's so many people making films there's so many people creating videos and creating content and creating noise and it's just so much out there there's so many different ways to see it um how do you make how do you get people to see your yeah. your film? And maybe if you get some awards or if you have people say that go see this film, that hopefully people will. And that's yeah. um that's the hope. Um obviously no one wants a terrible review, but sometimes I mean you can get a real nasty review. Like I have one fucking terrible review and I use it on the trailer, I use it on oh. the <laughs> website because it has a couple of great lines in it. Yeah. Like the guy writing it thought it would be this will take this guy apart. And I'm going, this is the best review. I, I love that you've written this, yeah. you know, it was just absolutely perfect. Um, so yeah, it just depends on how you use it with the ultimate goal being to share the work as wide as, as possible. And with a film, I suppose like this one, it, it does have a limited 
a potentially limited market because or not even market but just audience because yeah. you know people think oh experimental film is just you know I don't know a cement mixer on fire for 12 yeah. hours shot on fucking Betamax or something which you know I would love to do that um, and yeah. that's the next project in I'd fact. watch it but, or, yeah, yeah I totally <laughs> would um so it's really hard for people to to because experimental means absolutely anything yeah and nothing at the same time and so it's hard to convince people that this could be interesting that you could give this a go um and people as i said it's like a fast food kind of place where or it's like it's like anything like there's so many restaurants or places you can order food on or make food and it's like there's so many options why should i give my 95 yeah. minutes to you um who i've never heard of and it's it's experimental and you know so it's funny it, the it's use bad. of that though isn't it the way experimental uh, experimental is used now because you know, the great filmmakers were experimental, like Arson Wells is doing stuff in Citizen Kane mm-hmm. that nobody had done before. Absolutely. But, but yeah. now it's used this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of um, twee or, or, you know, this, the other rather than the stuff that, you know, it's strange. It's, yeah, it's one of those words. Um, even when I was, I mean, fully kind of integrating into that, into that area and, and screening, I mean, I guess I never really used labels. It was just only if it was useful for me to get money to make the thing or to get people to see the thing. And I'd rather if, you know, 15 people who are into experimental film saw it than five people from traditional narrative cinema saw it and hated it. So sometimes it's very good to have like a kind of a category. But yeah, I suppose it depends on who's using the phrase. Some Sometimes people can use it to kind of snark or to be yeah. down putting or something. But experimental cinema, as you say, it has a, a long and incredible legacy that goes back into, you know, into the silent era. I mean, the very first films were all, in many ways, I suppose, ethno kind of scientific endeavors. And they were all experiments. And mm-hmm. the further I went into experimental film, even just watching it, every time I would end up in the silent era anyway. So it all goes back to the beginning of cinema and to the mechanism um, of of the, of the, the cinema apparatus, both in viewing it and and in, in making and shooting film and or video or whatever, the kind of the machine. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I mean, yeah. I watched I watched um, Hitchcock's The Lodger this morning. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, and for people who don't know, this is one of his silent films. I think it was maybe 20, 1927. but. Um, that was very experimental in itself, the way it used color, um, because you know, like, it, it, um, obviously black and white was in use then, but he used specific tones and colors for for mm-hmm. for certain scenes. Now, I've gone on record a number of times to say that my color, uh, I'm not very good at um seeing colors. Like, I'm not color blind, but I'll see a green. No, not even that, that because green red is one of those things. But if you said to me what color is this thing, and it might be blue, but I I mightn't quite figure out what the color is so i'll have to make up something or and or else say is it cyan and hope for the best (laughs) it's not that's so i when i'm looking at these things i'm like i wonder what a normal person is seeing in this pictures but i i i thought of it you know obviously with you coming on and me seeing that this morning of even then they were they weren't just um shooting in black and white they were still doing stuff that might be interesting to the viewer and, and with colors and and techniques hinting and yeah all that yeah. kind of stuff even there's like er, earlier films you know like from the like the, even the like the 20s or even i mean i can't quite remember the first film they used hinting but i mean i've seen stuff in the irish film uh kind of the archive of irish cinema where you know people were not just tinting but i mean like uh, mid twenties, and they're like painting. You know, they've filmed a a scene of a fire erupting. You know, and they're they've painted the flames in each frame. Mm. You know, yellow, red. You know, and they're and green. And you know, they're this this uh, this added moment of of kind of danger or the way in which Hitchcock used color throughout yeah. his career. Anyway, I mean, but yeah, that's so so important. Um, what color, how it affects you, and how your brain decodes that information, or how mm. I suppose media conditions you to feel a certain way towards a certain color or yeah. whatnot. But very interesting to if, if someone is colorblind or someone doesn't have that association, I find that fascinating because I have a couple of friends who I have two friends who are colorblind, and uh, I did a film with. Um, Anaglyph 3D, and I remember sending them the glasses, and they were very curious to watch it. And they, yeah, they, 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 they couldn't really. It didn't work for them. Um, oh. And then other experiences where they were watching films, like you say, with tints, and it just, 
or it could be very subtle things like for example in a technical like digital cinema in presentation has operates in a different color space to like what this computer rgb rec 709 color space it operates in an xyz kind of color space and to spot the difference you can do with your naked eye mm. there's usually no red and they were unable to qc with their eye because they couldn't they couldn't see that so they would have to run it through a, a software to detect so that th these kind of things are fascinating yeah. kind of what the brain eliminates or can't process well, um, to you, Dean, I'm I'm glad you appreciate this kind of stuff because I get laughed at and I get that. Well, what color is that then? And what color is that over <laughs> there? I was like, it's no color. All right. Um, but it's, that's they're my own issue over there. What do you say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. But uh, so apart from the cement mixer on fire, what is next for you? And um, well, the cement mixer on fire is next. Yes. I'm looking I mean, forward no. to it. Um, well, I'm trying. Currently, I have a project in early stages of development and trying to find money to make it. Basically, financing, just trying to make it uh, happen, um, which is extremely difficult. It's as difficult as getting a film seen. Mm. It's just a constant. You're in a constant wrestling match from the second you write the idea down to when you're trying to get people to sit in front of it. Um, so we're trying our hardest to get money for that and again i suppose it would be more uh, i would uh, maybe a step further into narrative but still it would it doesn't leave the kind of the the work i've been developing this this it's just a little bit further i mean for me it's it's always interesting to do something different so of course, yeah, um, yeah. the point of that film was to do something different and now i want to do something different again um to make it interesting or else what's the point of doing it yeah I, I agree um so we always ask this question as well dean like what do you like to do in your spare time i like to um what do i like to do anymore i don't even know anymore um what do you like to do in your spare time actually maybe you know, this will help me yeah no do you know it's funny because everybody kind of stumbles on this one and i and like as soon as some probably because I ask the question all the time, but I love films, obviously. Yeah. I love music. I love playing instruments, musical instruments. I love to okay. read. I do jujitsu. Mm -hmm. I do CrossFit. I Very cool. run. I, that's probably it actually. All those things. Yeah. That's good. a lot. It's that's a lot. A, yeah, yeah. 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 That's good. Yeah, but I'm I mean, not, um... I'm not out there trying to finance films. You know what I mean? It's not the same thing. <laughs> Maybe you could like drop all those things and help me finance this. <laughs> Tell you what, that, uh, that you got yourself a deal. I get very <laughs> lazy and just do that, but but I I do um yeah I think I think it's, it's hard good to have something else to 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 do that's not yeah. what you're yeah like a, a diff like a a palate cleanser. To, but but I you're mean, yeah, like yeah. But you're writing and directing and trying to get the finished finances. So it's it's a lot of things on the same right. It's it's making yeah. films, but it's a lot of different things. Different things in yeah. making. So I can understand when people come on and they go, I don't know what. The, you know yeah. but they might go away from it and go like well i really like going for a walk and you know it might be just something simple yep. like that yeah i i, I uh remember the rowing club i row ah, there you uh, go i climbing i read a lot i look at this see you didn't you have any at, answers this, yeah, <laughs> i didn't i didn't think this is i was trying to think of something that was like, what do i do <laughs> these are the things that you know what what's probably what's terrible is i'm probably thinking about the other thing when i'm doing yeah, those things that's so when am i yeah, so uh, maybe I should try and do harder things that I can't think about anything other than the activity I'm doing. Jiu-Jitsu is the only thing I can think of that that uh, falls into place. People are bored of listening to me uh, talking about it, but you go and get when you're sparring with someone in Jiu-Jitsu for those five minutes, oh, you, yeah. do, you don't remember, you don't think of anything or you don't worry, I don't have anxiety, uh, nothing. It's just yeah. literally I have to yeah. choke or get choked. <laughs> this is what it boils down to like. You know. yeah, this this is this is actually really this is really important um yeah being able to plug out of of, of yourself for a while yeah i yeah, think i think that's a really important thing yeah and i think but like when you think it is something like rowan and look i've talked about regards to running and not thinking about you know anxiety or other mental health problems that i might be having mm -hmm. at the time um you know like you said there it's important to be doing the rowing and actually just be doing the rowing or taking in what's yeah. around you, you know. But it's actually quite funny, yeah, that, that I guess if you get into a rhythm, you don't need to think about, it. Yeah. with rowing, it's kind of funny, like the second you start thinking about the different things you're doing, you start messing up. And then when you start thinking too comfortably about 
not what you're doing you mess up yeah. so there is a kind of fine line but running yeah i do running but uh, i think a lot i used to play music when i run um and i don't run anywhere interesting i'm grim like i would just go like i'm right near phoenix park you yeah. know like so i could i could find something i go to a football pitch a big rectangle and i just do laps of it like because if i'm running i'm navigating like dogs and bike paths and you know it's a bit uh, i don't know i i, I don't know I, I go to bike. I run out in the bog. It's actually, oh wow, yeah. It's it's just literally just on the road. But the um, is that dangerous? Like, would you not go into? No, because like a... it's just that the road be the road through ah, it. Okay. Like, it's quite a yeah, narrow road, yeah. but it's you know where where they cut the turf and all that. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, um, but it's it's very. You know, it's just flat, obviously, but it's it's very peaceful. And like sometimes I'll, I'll listen to podcasts or sometimes I'll I'll just if it's spring, I might listen to the birds kind of a thing. But it yeah. is very relaxing um, and it takes your mind off other things. And, you know, like I, I, what I like about running, it's not the same as rowing, I'm sure, and, and, and climbing and things, because it there's nothing to think about. You're literally one foot in front yeah. of the other. So once you do the first few yards and you get into that, that's gone. And I think it can open other ways and you can maybe be creative or think about oh, this idea or a song or something where you, mm. I just like it. Yeah. I, I get a lot from it. Yeah. Yeah. But this I isn't my the... episode. This is your episode. <laughs> no, hang on. This is getting interesting. Now. Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I've, the well, problem is, is like when you're running, you're listening to music. I used to, I do what I do. I, I like to read a lot. I listen to a lot of podcasts and audiobooks, and I go through phases with audiobooks, like mm-hmm. where I can, I have to have a, a couple of different ones for different activities, like depending yeah. on my concentration and stuff like that. So running, yeah. I mean, the problem is if you don't download them, I have Audible and all that stuff, but uh, sometimes you get ads and you're running and you're trying to yeah. fucking turn the ads off or you don't want to, you know. Yeah or someone's ringing you or something. So maybe sometimes just to run without any devices to not be, you know, to have anything attached to you is a nice feeling and you're running them for the sake of, of running. That that can be very nice. That's what's nice yeah. about climbing and what's nice about rowing. Well, with rowing, you can leave your phone in the boat and you probably won't capsize or anything. It's usually, I've never heard of that happening, but yeah, I mean, getting away from technology is just being outside. I much yeah. prefer countryside than, than the city. City is functional, but, you know, you need to be there to do a thing, but I much prefer outside. Um, yeah, absolutely. And anything that leads me outside, any activity that br- takes me outside, I'll I'll do, um, I suppose. But yeah, I guess I do do a few things. But uh, maybe After I should do all, more. You maybe maybe should, do, I should, should do more. Yeah, you should. But my, yeah, I, 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 there is always the kind of the pull towards wanting to do more. But, you know, it is obviously time consuming these things and to kind of. Mm-hmm. I started doing crosswords, strangely enough. Um, crosswords? Yeah, yeah, just the New Yorker online, and you could just do one every day. And um, I, t- I, my mom likes them. I, I never really got into them. And now all of a sudden, I'm like, I can't wait for the crossword to come out. That's age, you see. That's that is <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> that's age thing, though. But uh, do you find it, I mean, immediately now, my, my kind of, uh, I mean, I would rather do that on the paper. On the yeah, I would. Newspaper, yeah. With the pen and paper. So I'd be almost like, that doing it online would be anything that I, if I can get away from a computer, I would avoid, you know, I, I yeah, would. So I agree. That's something I would, but yeah, crosswords, man, that's interesting. I don't I know. Just I just want know. It's, There's lots of things. There's lots the, of things you know, the, doing, like. the idea about the paper and the screen and, and that, that's a, a thing I've talked about before where like, I've just got books everywhere scattered around. And the problem is like mm-hmm. when I move and I will move eventually that there's going to be a hell of a lot of trips Whereas, you know, I understand people who want to read uh, when they go traveling, they might have two books on their iPad or on their phone. Now, yeah. I've done that with guests coming up. So I'd say, say if it was yourself and you had a book and four days mm-hmm. ago I found out you're coming on, it's easy for me to just download it and read it there. And sure. but, I, but I don't like it. I, I honestly don't. You'd rather have the physical book. Oh, yeah, way more. Too. You know, yeah. it's it's I, I like I write like short stories from time to time. Right. And it'll be pen and paper. Like it's not, it's never okay. tight. Oh yeah. It's never, pen and paper. Okay. Okay. Have you looked into like, um, like using a typewriter or just, you really just prefer the pen and paper? No, like it's to... not that like I'll do the first draft on the pen and paper. And then if right. I want to, if someone wants to see it, but I do have a typewriter, but it's an electro- electronic, 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 <laughs> I got the word there, electronic typewriter. <laughs> and I didn't, I, there was, I wanted the, 
the 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 old school manual one, but this was yeah yeah, and I would yeah, and I I actually kind of it's weird. Let's trade typewriters. I got one or two that are the really old manual ones. Yeah, I prefer one of the early IBM. That's what mine. Something like that. Thinking. Yeah, this is <clears throat> this is kind of nice. I just I think there's something efficient about it. I've tried typing. For me, it's just formatting. Yeah. Um. Uh, maybe this conversation, if, unless you're Tom Hanks, who I know has a collection of typewriters. He loves it. Maybe. Yeah, he very, loves it. Very interesting. But yeah, I mean, like, I just, I really like that being close to the to the thing. And he, in Hole in the Head, I had lots of these little kind of cards and little script uh, private notes, like an archive of memories that the character yeah. had made. They're all type, type yeah. printed, like on a typewriter. And um, if there's, even though they aren't even in the film, any excuse to spend time hearing that sound i think he might that. be similar to wes anderson or something. <laughs> you know you know i think he's quite hardcore though i think he's probably like yeah you know, like inhaling the typewriter <laughs> ribbon or yeah whatever. he's yeah. he's a different um have you ever had that idea on on, on your films because there is the, the the discussion that he uses his dress sense to dress his characters like you know the the, the pants are too short he always wears his pants yeah. too short so other people in his films his pants too short do you ever think of just going for your own look with everybody you mean like anything you wear just throw them on them I that's like for my own like clothing yeah. I would just go right John you're wearing this you're wearing that and yeah like, no, I, I don't know that would kind of terminate the the excitement of being able to dress the character and I mean yeah. if I'm already dressed in that way I mean, I don't really, I don't dress in, interestingly, you know, no, I just wear way. black on black. I mean, even yeah. my underpants are black, man. Yeah, I mean, it's me like, too. <laughs> I, yeah, it would look like, you know, an early 90s beatnik kind of like <laughs> yeah. gathering or something in fucking Kerry or Carlo or something. Maybe that's what was where we shot it. So that's what it would have been like. Yeah, and I, I'm glad we got to dress them. And in some cases, using these like different items of clothing or you know, even like, for example, working with James and we were, went through so many different types of spectacles. Um, that was such a, sometimes the actor kind of requires this, that as an inroad into the character. Yeah. How can I potentially chisel through this great kind of like impossible structure? And yeah. it's like a small thing like that can just do it. And I found with the clothing, when I was talking to them about clothing and it, that was the key to get them inside the thing and to get me into what their thoughts were on, on the character more so than just sitting down and going, right. Brainstorm. Yeah. You know, uh, what's her star sign and what's, you know, like, <laughs> what's your star sign? Like? That's a great first yeah. question as well, isn't it? It's so, yeah. it's so off putting when someone asks you what your star sign is. It's like, what? Answer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kill it stone dead. But listen, Dean, like if someone wanted to find you and, Instagram or wherever or look up your work sure. or whatever where can they do so they can find me on all the usual social medias um website deancabinet.com uh the it, social media handle is usually deancabinet underscore at the end so if you just you'll generally even if you don't want to find me I'm probably there just like in real life yeah um, well me too just, I get you yeah <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'm out there. So um, if you want to look at the other films and the films uh, that the cast and crew have made, it's all you know their their work, James's work. Um, James is a writer director in his mm-hmm. own uh, his own kind of career of of, of films, and uh, Lynette also, and uh, and yeah, I mean, we uh, <clears throat> we worked with an amazing guy called Michael Higgins. Michael was like. I don't think we would have gotten through with all of the analog elements if it wasn't for his expertise. And he's an exceptional uh, filmmaker, experimental filmmaker, working across like different formats and specifically film and and mm. and and video. Well, spe- specifically film. Um, his work is well worth checking out. So excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. What a supportive director we have here. But uh, <laughs> Dean, you've been. Uh, they'll hurt me. They'll hurt me if <laughs> yeah. I don't give this information. Yeah. It's a, they'll hurt. No, no, just. D- Dean, yeah. you've been a, a brilliant guest. If you wouldn't mind hanging around for two pleasure. seconds, I'll close cool. this out, get a photo, and, and we're going away. Um, I also have to thank, as I always do, John Francis for his technical stuff. Not quite as technical stuff as Dean doing. Sorry, John. It's not. You're just putting stuff Thanks, in YouTube. John. <laughs> like that. Um, yeah, that's hard that's hard to do it well yeah well i can't do it so i, I have to go ahead and um, uh, i have to thank my mom my dad my granddad 
Duran Calvin for the music and the logo. Uh, YouTube uh, channel, subscribe if you would. Um, Instagram, Facebook, X, I hate saying that. Uh, Spotify, Apple, Anchor, Google Podcasts and all the other ones. And uh, thanks to everybody who watched and listened today. And once again, Dean, thanks very much. Cool. My absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Eric. Uh, Der- Derek. No worries. Derek. Actually, you know what? Here's a final thing. Go. Um, I was thinking of uh, I when I when I was thinking of your, of your name, I was thinking of Bad Taste. Remember the Peter Jackson film? Yes. Yeah. Why Derek's don't run? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a Derek. Derek's don't run. So well, you, you know, it's better than Derek Davis because that's what people used to say to me when I was Derek. in the early nineties. Uh, that's how I remember the name Derek Davis. That's insulting. Um, no, I'm sure he's a nice man. All right, everybody. <laughs> Take care of yourselves. We'll chat to you next week. Bye.